Okay, that's April 14, 2022. This is Physics 38 at LA Harbor College. So we are about to finish chapter 28, which is DC circuits. We are, we just finished the mathematical treatment of a RC of an RC circuit. An RC circuit is a circuit that involves a resistor and a capacitor. Just to close down this chapter here. So, how does the capacitor behave at time t equal to zero? You know, just soon after time t equal to zero, a zero plus. Okay. So at time t, it, it, it's very easy to remember that. At time t equal to zero, the capacitor is uncharged. We place an uncharged capacitor in the circuit. Because the capacitor is uncharged, the voltage across the plates of the capacitor is going to be zero as well. Okay? And what behaves, uh, which type of device behaves as a zero electrical potential difference? Okay, it's very easy to remember that. You know, the device that behaves like a zero pot uh, electrical potential difference is just your regular wire. Your regular regular wire has negligible resistance and the potential difference between two ends of a, a wire is going to be zero. So at time t equal to zero, the, so what can you tell me about the behavior of the capacitor at time t equal to zero plus? Okay, it it means that the capacitor behaves like a regular wire. Okay, like a short circuit. But that's at time t equal to zero plus. So that's how you can treat your capacitor at this instant of time. Okay? And what about a t much greater than that uh, time constant of the circuit, RC? Okay? If uh, the time is long enough, the capacitor is going to be fully charged and it's going to work against the potential difference of the battery. What does it mean? It means the capacitor, you know, it is as though the capacitor is not there. It means that as though that you have a break in the circuit. Okay? So you have those two limiting conditions on how an RC circuit behaves. At time t equal to zero plus, capacitor behaves like a short circuit wire. And at time t greater, much greater than RC, the capacitor behaves like a a broken wire okay and if the capacitor behaves like a broken wire the co current in the circuit is zero and that's exactly what happens whenever because the capacitor is working against the battery okay that's what uh, I want you to remember it's an important uh, thing to understand same thing for the same thing for the capacitor for the RC circuit whenever the whenever you are discharging the circuit. Okay, same thing. What we are going to do now is chapter 29. It's going to be magnetic fields. Here we go, let's, uh, let's get the note right in here. Physics note, insert. That's four fourteen twenty two four fourteen twenty two. Okay, magnetic fields. You know, magnetic field has been known. Let me see, magnetic materials has been known for a long time. Been known since antiquity, at least. And been known since antiquity, at least. Ancient Greeks documented the existence of a special type of stone that what would attract small pieces of... Uh, it would attract uh, iron filings. So, but they didn't quite understand what happened, how, how this whole thing would behave. 
Remember, the ancient Greeks was around 200 BC, 300 BC. So it took uh, basically, you know, it, it took uh, how many centuries? It took uh, 2,000 years for us to have a, a good grasp of what magnetic fields were all about. People would, in, would make use of the magnetic field of the Earth, but they didn't quite understand exactly how this thing, uh, what was exactly that was happening, okay? And what you have to know about magnetic fields for this chapter specifically. Okay, here you go. Here's a little bit, uh, a little bit of history, okay? And there are all sorts of applications of the magnetic field. Okay, the oldest application of the magnetic field is the magnetic compass. Okay, it was the Chinese who invented the magnetic compass. Has, has anybody watched that the TV series uh, Marco Polo, The Travels of Marco Polo? You gotta watch it, it's pretty good. Okay, it was, uh, I believe it was the Amazon Prime. I, I was watching it. And they were describing the travels of Marco Polo in the court of Genghis Khan. They say that uh, Marco Polo stayed with the Chinese, right? That that's what I that's what I thought before I I watched that that TV series. Actually, Marco Polo stayed on the Mongolian on the Mongolian territory. At that at that time, the Mongolians they conquered mo most of China, a big swath of China, just back in the 1200. And then we have, first we had uh, Genghis Khan, right? And then after Genghis Khan, you had someone else that you have heard of too. You have heard of Kublai Khan. Okay? And Marco Polo stayed in the court of Kublai Khan. And when he went there to Mongolia in, during his travels, he noticed that the Mongols were using a little device that could point the direction of the north. It was like a, a little fish. A magnetized fish that they would put in the water. It is not. It was not. It was not exactly a fish. It was like a, a metal bar that was shaped in a fish, in the in a, in a fish like, in a water bowl. Okay, and uh, the the Italians at that time didn't know about this invention. But this invention of the compass was a Chinese invention. And then later on, the Mongolians start using, right? And then the Arabs started using as well. And then finally, the magnetic compass was introduced to the, to the Europeans around the 1300, after Marco Polo traveled to the court of Kublai Khan. And that's what allowed the magnetic compass, that's what allowed the Portuguese to to go and explore other continents with his with their caravels with their ships not just the compass but also the mechanical clock too you needed compass the mechanical the magnetic compass were not enough they needed something else as well to help them circumnavigate the tip of africa and go to india and even discover brazil and the americas okay so it was the magnetic compass is a very important invention and it's due to the Chinese, the Chinese that invented. But the Chinese didn't invent the magnetic compass for navigation purposes. That's the funny thing about that, about the invention. The Chinese invented the magnetic compass only as a divination tool. They were using the magnetic compass to arrange the furniture in their houses. You know, that's the way you arrange the furniture to have good luck. That's the Feng Shui divination right type of divination later on people figured out that we could use the magnetic compass for for navigation purpose the mongols the arabs and finally during the crusades the europeans were introduced to the magnetic compass through the arabs just the arabs that introduced the magnetic compass to the europeans it is interesting that the the Mongolians didn't use the magnetic compass to navigate to, to the Americas. They didn't do that. 
the Chinese neither, even though they had the magnetic compass to do that. The Arabs didn't do that. It took the Europeans to do that. Okay? You had a very important tool there at your disposal to navigate across the oceans, and uh, but it took the Europeans to make good use of this tool. The Vikings, even before the, Euro the Europeans, right? The, the Vikings were, were Europeans too, right? But the Nordic people of the Europe, they also managed to reach Greenland. And even they say that they reached it here in North America as well. But they didn't use the magnetic compass. They used a different device, which was like a type of crystal that allowed them to orient, get bearings through the to the navigation. But they had an advantage because we, we they were living through the small ice age at that time. So they didn't have to navigate through the open seas. They could use the ice that had accumulated during that uh, small ice age at that, at, that, at that time to reach the Americas, okay? Okay, so just a little introduction of how important uh, the magnetic field is. It's possible to convert electrical to mechanical energy by magnetic means. Okay, that's how important magnetic field is. Today, the electricity, not only we can convert electrical into mechanical energy by magnetic means, but we can do the opposite as well. We can convert mechanical energy into electrical energy using the magnetic field. And we are going to learn how that works. So, another point to make, magnetic field is very important. There are several useful devices that use the magnetic field. Okay, right now uh, the, we are using the magnetic field to confine very hot gases to produce nuclear, f nuclear fusion. The same process that occurs in the sun. The difference of magnetic conf uh, confinement, the, the difference between the, uh, the nuclear fusion that we do here on Earth and the nuclear fusion that ha happens at the sun is the type of force. At the sun, because the sun has a very large mass, the hot gases are confined by the force of gravity. And the force of gravity allows, because of the pressure of, of the force of gravity, it allows the atoms to fuse themselves and liberate energy, okay? What we are trying to do here is not use the gravitational field to confine very hot gases. You, you take a huge amount of mass, much larger than the mass of the Earth. So they have to figure out a different way. They have to figure out a way to confine this gas a very high pressure. What they do? They use the magnetic field to do that. Okay? Okay, light itself and other forms of radiation. Electro, other forms of electromagnetic radiation. That's the better way, electromagnetic radiation. Originates from an interaction between the magnetic and electric field. That's why it's called electromagnetic radiation. Video, audio cassette recorders, electric motors, TV pictures, tubes, computer discs, they all use the magnetic field. So just by understanding how the magnetic field behaves. Yeah. Which one? Solid state drive. Solid, well, where is it written? Solid state drive. I didn't put that here, right? Uh, videos, okay, audio cassette recorders. Computer, computer this. Oh, yeah, they do. Uh huh, they do. Yes, uh, I, I can give you the references. And, and you're going to see that uh, it do. In the case of TV picture tubes, that's, that's easy, right? Uh, it, that's the same the deal, same thing as the uh, the electric field. You can you can do TV pictures using not only the electric field but the magnetic field. And the computer disk, yes, I can I can give the reference here when I, you're gonna see that there is some some magnetic field involved in there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, there is more. It's not just technological applications, but some birds, bacteria, and sea turtles use their magnetic field. There. 
there are researchers out there, I know some of them, that they, they study magnetostatic bacteria. They orient themselves used through the magnetic field. So what you have to know, oh, oh, one more thing here. There is a very important thing. Let, let me write that down here in the other one. Here you go. There is a very important Oh yeah, there is a very important difference between the electric field and the magnetic field. Okay? Electric field let the sources of electric field the sources of electric field are the positive and the negative electric charges okay so we can generate an electric field with either a positive or negative charge okay the sources of the magnetic field is different. Not the sources. Yeah, let's see. The source of magnetic field is different. And we're going to get there. Magnetic field is different. There is no such a thing. There is no such a thing called magnetic charges. Okay? There is no such a thing. You may find, here you go, you may find, you do find, you do find electric monopoles in nature. Not so, not so for the magnetic field. The, in other words, There are no magnetic monopoles. Okay? There's no magnetic monopoles. We haven't discovered any of that yet. Nobody has ever observed, although there are scientists who are searching for magnetic monopoles. And some people believe that the, at the beginning of the Big Bang, we, ha we did have magnetic monopoles, but we have yet to discover anything like that. So, what do you have instead? Instead of having magnetic monopoles, we have magnetic dipoles that exist. Okay? And we name one end of a magnetic bar the north polarity or the plus or the positive polarity of the magnet. And the, the other end of the magnetic bar, we it, we call it the south polarity or the negative polarity of a magnetic bar. If you break down a magnet, you, you will never, and that's, that's experimentation, we have done that over and over again. If you break down a magnet in small pieces, you will never get a north pole or a positive magnetic pole separated from the south pole. Every time that you break your magnet, you always end up forming a south pole in the smaller piece, a north and south pole in the smaller piece. Okay, so that's a law of physics. Here we go. One of the law of physics, one of the laws of physics states that there are no magnetic monopoles. And that's a, uh, and that is described in a mathematical way, mathematical way, by an integral equation that you're going to become familiar with, integral equation. Okay. That's the piece, important piece of information that you have to keep in your mind. Okay, so we do we can draw the magnetic field lines from a magnet bar, 
a, mag um, a magnetic dipole, they look just like that. The magnetic fields of a magnetic bar is very similar to the electric field of an electric dipole. You start at the positive, the field starts at the positive charge, right? In the electric dipole and ends at the negative charge. Here is something similar. The magnetic field starts at the positive pole and ends up at the negative or south pole. If you put a magnet compass in this field, the magnetic compass is going to point parallel, tangent, let's say tangent to the magnetic field lines. They do not necessarily point towards the north or the south. But they still can be used as a navigation tool. Okay, so here you go. If you have the Earth, let's take a look at the Earth, how it uh, looks like. Okay, we have the Earth is a sphere. Some people out there believe that the Earth is a flat, right? It's a flat surface. No, no, the Earth is a sphere. It's a sphere that rotates about an axis, an axis of rotation. This is a mechanical axis of rotation. This imaginary axis of rotation cross two points across the surface of the Earth at two important points. Okay, here you go. One point is the South Pole. Let me read this one now. The, that point, the one point is the North Pole. That point we call the North Geographical Pole. We're talking about a mechanical type of behavior, right? Of the Earth. And then we also have the, on the other side of the globe, the South Geographic Pole. The South Geographic Pole is located in the Antarctica, in the Antarctica continent, in the continent of Antarctica. Okay, and... Uh, and this axis that you see right in here, this imaginary axis of rotation of the Earth, points towards a star. Okay, if you are an amateur astronomer, you should know which star it is. Anybody knows the name of this star? Nobody? It's a very bright star that we have here in the Northern Hemisphere. There in Brazil, in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't have bright stars pointing the direction of... Uh, of the South Pole. Okay, the name of the star is the Polaris star in the small deeper in, in small deeper constellation, small bear constellation. There's a big deeper than small deeper, deeper. Okay, and if you can locate the, the Polaris the star, which, which is kind of very bright, you know, you just draw a line perpendicular to the horizon, and you can see where the you can find where the north the north direction is. So, but sometimes you know, think about that. The navigators, you know, the the early navigators, they had to rely on on, on clear skies to get their bearings. Okay, they had to rely on clear skies to get their bearings. So, if the the sky was not clear, if it was overcast, they couldn't do a good job navigating at all. That's why it was so important the introduction of the magnetic compass. But why am I talking about that? Okay, because there is there is something else too that you have to worry. In addition to the north and south geographic pole, which are which are mechanical features of the Earth of our planet, we also the all, the Earth also has a magnetic pole. The Earth and many other planets out there behave just like a huge magnet bar like that okay behave just like a huge magnetic dipole at this point in time the magnetic poles are inverted compared to the geographic poles okay so what we have nearby the north geographic pole we have the south portion of our magnetic bar the South Magnetic Pole. And nearby the South Geographic Pole, we have the North Magnetic Pole. Those points are very close to each other. 
The difference is that this magnetic pole keep on wandering about the geographical pole. They change their position as time goes by. Okay, and one day, you know, this every now and then, this polarity, this magnetic polarity of the Earth switch back and forth. It takes like hundred thousands of years to do that. Okay. So here you go. Here's the magnetic axis of the Earth. Has it makes a small angle with the axis of rotation of the Earth. See here if I got everything right. Okay. Okay, and here go. Here's another way of picturing the magnetic pole, right? I can get uh, the North Pole pointing upwards. I can get the the, mag the geographical pole points upwards, I can get the magnetic, the, ax the magnetic axis pointing upwards. And that's how the magnetic field lines of the Earth look like. That was of, of a magnetic dipole. Okay, it, the magnetic field lines start at this, at the southern hemisphere. Okay, because we have the North magnetic pole there in the southern hemisphere. And the end at the other end of this pole. Can you remember that? Right? So what else do we know about uh, magnetic poles? What we know is that just like in electricity, if you place the negative of a magnetic bar next to the negative of uh, another magnetic bar, they're going to repel. So just like electric force, you know, opposite attract, op opposite attract. Okay, everybody has played with magnets, right? Compass. Who has played with compasses and magnets? I used to play with those things when uh, when I was a little kid there in Brazil. Cool. Anybody else? There, the kids there in the back. No. Quiet. Okay, it's very important to you know. To, to play with, so, so you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, what's next? Okay, there's one more thing that you have to know. That's where the heavy calculation starts. Right now, it's just qualitative ideas. Okay, I'm going and I'm going to document here for you. Here you. Go. One of the laws of physics states that there are no magnetic monopoles, and that's described in a mathematical way by an integral equation. Okay. Uh, the simplest magnetic uh, configuration is that of a magnetic dipole. That's the simplest configuration they're going to find for the magnetic devices. Okay, there again, again, there are no magnetic monopoles. You know, a magnetic dipole has a positive or north polarity at one end and a negative or south polarity. Instead of a magnetic dipole, let's put here a magnetic bar as a positive at the other end. Okay. Like poles repel, unlike poles attract. Easy enough to remember. The 
is what we have here. So those are the basic, very basic ideas that you have to know. And now that's when, you know, things start to become a little bit more difficult, okay? This is something that we can demonstrate in real life. If you have a magnetic field, you know, and then you put an electric charge in this magnetic field, if you perform experiments, okay, you, you're going to observe something. If the charge is at rest, there's no way to prove that mathematically, okay? That's, uh, that's just an experimental, experimental result. If the charge is at rest, we find that there is no magnetic force whatsoever applied to the charge. Okay? Similarly, well, if the charge is moving, suppose now that we have the charge moving, but now the charge is moving in a direction parallel to the electric to the magnetic field lines. The speed of the charge is greater than zero, but the vector velocity is parallel to the magnetic field lines. What we find? We find the magnetic force is also zero. Things start to become interesting when the velocity vector is not parallel to the magnetic field lines. Here, in this case, velocity now is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. We find that there is a magnetic force applied to this charge. And we, I can demonstrate that to you here rather easily. And this magnetic force has been measured as being QVB. It depends on the velocity of the charge. Okay? And there is more. The direction of the force is going to be perpendicular to the velocity and it's going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field as well. And that's what we have here is the is one of the laws of physics, the magnetic force law, or Lorentz force law, is Q V cross B. Gotta rem gotta memorize that. Okay. Magnetic force perpendicular to V. Magnetic force is going is a vector that's going to be also perpendicular, simultaneously perpendicular to V and B. Okay, and then we have the most generic situation in which the velocity is going to make an angle with the magnetic field. In this case, we still have a magnetic force, but the magnetic force is going to be given by this equation here, QVB sine of theta. Just like before, you know, it is given by QV cross B. That's the genetic force, that's the genetic law that you have to memorize. Okay? So here you go. Charge subjected to a magnetic field Okay, here we go. We have the following cases. If a charge is at rest, the magnetic force is zero. If a charge, electric charge, let's put here, electric charge is subjected. If an electric charge if an electric charge is the rest, um, the magnetic force is zero. If the electric charge is moving in a direction parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, comma, the magnetic force is, is still zero. It is still zero. Okay. Now, if the electric charge is moving in a direction 
perpendicular to the magnetic field, then the magnetic force is going to be maximum. Then the magnetic force will have a maximum value. Finally, if an electric charge is moving in a direction, uh, it makes an angle, makes an angle theta with the magnetic field. Then the magnetic force can be written as as you know, let's see let's get our equations going here you know. You go magnetic for gonna write that down in terms of vectors. Here you go, I got it. So that's the most that's gonna be your most genetic equation. This equation that you see here applies to all those four conditions. It's gonna be charge Q charge Q velocity V. Cross product magnetic field B. Okay. Magnetic field B. Like I said, that's the most genetic equation they're gonna find out there. You know, if if the velocity is zero, right? Item one. This magnetic force is going to be zero. If the electric charge is moving in a direction parallel or under parallel to the magnetic field, this cross product is going to be zero. Okay? If an electric charge is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, V cross B. The magnitude of V cross B is going to be VB. Okay? Because the sine of 90 degrees is going to be 1. And finally, if an electric charge is moving in that direction, that makes an angle theta, the magnitude of a magnetic field is going to be QVB sine of theta. Okay? That's the most generic equation. It's called Lorentz force law. Lorentz force law. That's your first uh, equation for a law for a magnetic field. What else you need to know? You go. Okay, so now I'm going to illustrate the part in a different way. Okay, the charge. Here you go. Is this what you see there in that illustration? Is this one here? But rotate, you have to rotate the figure. Okay? You have to rotate in such a way so you can look from the top to see the magnetic field lines. Okay, here you go. That's what it is. You look here from this direction. When you look from the top, 
when you, or when you rotate the plane of this illustration towards you, you're going to see something like that. Can you picture that? Magnetic fields, the arrows of the magnetic field comes, coming towards you, and the electric uh, and the velocity vector of the charge is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So, what happens when you have a situation like that? Okay, at this, you already know that the magnetic force is going to be perpendicular to both the velocity vector and the magnetic field. Okay? So I'm going to simplify this drawing. Okay? So here you go. Let's, uh, let's start with uh, the magnetic field first. Okay? We picture that later on. Okay, here we go. We start with a. Well, what we have here is a uniform magnetic field in space. We have something else here that needs to be deleted. Okay, what this guy is doing here? We don't need that either. Oh, we don't need that either. So we start with a magnetic uniform magnetic field in space. Okay, and then you introduce something else. What we introduce? We introduce the x axis, x z axis. Okay. Y is into the plane. Uh, just means what I want. Oh, okay. So here you go. Here you go. X, Z axis. Y axis is into the plane. Has to be into the plane. What else do we need? We're going to put an electric charge in this magnetic field. Let me copy the my electric charge. Here you go. We're going to put it right in here. And this electric charge is going to be moving. And the, electric, and the, mag and the velocity of the charge is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. We're doing okay, like that. So why, what can can we expect from the magnetic force law? We know that this magnetic force is going to be simultaneously perpendicular to the magnetic field lines and the velocity vector. We, what else do we know? Well, because this force is perpendicular to the velocity vector, we do know that this force is not going to do any work on the electric charge. What does it mean doing no work? It means that the velocity, the speed of the charge is not going to increase. It's going to remain the same. The speed, but not the direction of the velocity vector. The direction of the velocity vector is going to change. If the magnetic field is uniform, then the particle is going to undertake to describe a circular motion. I'm going to put here a, a dashed better. And as the particle, you know, has this velocity vector, later on the particle is going to be here. It's going to be here and so on. Okay, let me put another slide here velocity vector right here you go let's let's do that again so you don't lose track what's happening 
Let's start with the magnetic field, uniform magnetic field. And or let's put our axis, x and z axis, x, y, z axis, oriented like that. And on the top of that, we're going to put a charge, a char an electric charge. In this case, the electric charge is positive. What, and we are going to give a velocity to the charge that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. What do we expect is going to happen? We expect that there will be a magnetic force perpendicular to both the velocity vector and the magnetic field. A little bit off, right? Let's see here. Here you go. And because now we have this force that's perpendicular to the velocity vector, this force is going to make the particle to move in circle, to undergo a circular motion. Because the magnetic field is not changing and the velocity, the magnitude of velocity is not changing either, this force is going to be, the magnitude of this force is going to be the same, which will result in uniform circular motion. In a uniform circular motion, okay? What's going on? Okay. I didn't put the Q there, right? Let me put the Q there. Let me copy this Q. Here we go. Here we go. Right in here. Right in here. Right in here. And go right in here. You know, a little bit later on, this charge is going to move somewhere here in this circle. The velocity vector is going to be tangent to this spot right here. The Velocity vector next to the arrow, we go the Q next to the charge. Okay, and now the force is going to be placed at a, a different spot. It's still going to be a centripetal force. You can do the V cross B, right? V cross B, V cross B going to point towards the center of the circle. Okay, the force is going to be given by that. Relation that I introduced to you. Oops. Right in here. Magnetic force. I'm going to put here, I'm going to put here, I'm going to put here, that's what you have to know, let's see if there's anything else that you should know, 545, we're reaching here the point for a break, huh, okay, I can erase that, Okay, so let's take a little break now before we go for a break. Let me take attendance. I will pause. Good, it's recording. So here we are solving for the unit of the magnetic field using the Lorentz force law. The magnetic the unit for the magnetic field is Newton's second coulomb per coulomb per meter. This unit shows up so frequent that we call it the Tesla. Okay. 
what else we got? I got to know. He go in honor of Nikola Tesla. Okay, this was the guy that worked with Thomas Edison. And there was a movie, a very good movie, that described the interaction between Tesla, Edison, and the, the business, businessman Westinghouse, which is the current war. SI unit for the magnetic field is the Tesla. Okay, and the Tesla is a very strong magnetic field. The field, the magnetic field of the Earth on the ground is approximately something else that we call one Gauss. It's another type of unit of magnetic field, okay? And one Gauss is approximately 10 to minus 4 Tesla. So the field that we have right in here is very small compared to, to one Tesla. Okay, we can skip that. That's an example. Oh, yeah, let's do this one. This one's going to be a nice problem to deal with. Okay, so let's look at the case of a charged particle of charge Q greater than zero with a velocity vector having a non component Vx and Vy. Find the magnetic force in the, if the field is uniform and along the positive direction of Y. Okay, so let's uh, copy that. I'm going to, let's press C. Example. Okay, here we go. The situation is like that. The velocity vector is given that the particle has a Vx and Vy component. Okay. Uh, Vx and Vy component. Here go V, Y. Put the hat there. Here you go. X hat, here you go. Given that. B field is uniform and along the positive direction of the Y axis. Here you go. It's, uh, I'm gonna put uh, just a B here. Find the magnetic force if the B field is uniform. Well, okay, find the magnetic force. Here we go. Right in here. All you gotta do is to solve this equation. Q, V, you know, you gotta replace that right in here we go cross with B field at this point in time you should know how to do cross products we are going to cross the Y hat with the other I'm going to put this B elsewhere here you go right in here and now I'm going to distribute the y hat right in here to with the other okay right in here here you go z hat x hat cross y hat is z hat y hat cross y hat is zero that's what we get for the magnetic force you just tell you the mag what's the magnetic force at that specific instant of time 
Okay, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen after all. But you are going to end up having a uniform circular motion. Just like I illustrated before. Okay. That's okay, that's example. Okay, and uh, you already know that we have a centripetal force, right? So what uh, what we can do? We can find out what's going to be the centripetal acceleration of the charge due to the magnetic force. Okay, we're going to do here this problem. So assume, okay, assume another example, okay? Example, another example, another example. Assume that the velocity vector is perpendicular to the magnetic field. field. Okay. Find the centripetal. Uh, let's see. A charged. Here you go. A charged particle. Let's. A charged particle. Q is subjected to a magnetic, to a uniform magnetic field. Assume that the velocity vector is perpendicular to the B field. B field. Find the centripetal acceleration of the of the charge. Uh, charge particle. Charge particle. Uh, a particle, here you go, a particle of mass m, of mass m, m, charge q, is subjected to a uniform magnetic field. Assume that the velocity vector is perpendicular to the B field. Find the centripetal acceleration of the charge. Okay? You can do that too. You already know that's going to be a uniform, uh, circular uniform motion. Okay, so solution. The, oh, don't forget, the only force applied to the, to the charge is the magnetic force. The only force applied to the charge is the magnetic force. Find the centripetal acceleration of the charge. Okay, let me go. So you already know that the magnetic force in this case is going to be given. Uh, should assume the velocity vector. Uh, okay, I gotta put that something else here. A particle of mass m, charge q, charge q, and a speed v is subject to a uniform magnetic field. Assume, assume that the velocity of the particle, velocity vector is perpendicular to the B field. The only force applied to the charge is the magnetic force. Find the centripetal acceleration of the charge, okay? So it's gonna be something like that, QVB. Okay? The only force is the magnetic force. What does it mean? It means that the magnetic force is going to be equal to the net force. Like that. According to the Newton's, to Newton's second law, net force is equal to ma. Okay. So we go, we get... This, this equation, 
okay acceleration is equal to q dv over m like that that would be the centripetal acceleration of the charge what else can we do 638 we're running out of time here okay Now, I just now suppose that we have an electric field now as well, not just a magnetic field, but an electric field. Okay, so suppose we have an electric field as well. As well. The net force is going to be what? The net force is going to be the electric force plus the magnetic force. Okay. So charge. It's going to be heat go. Uh oh. Let's see here. Go down. So now the net four he go. I got it. You go electric force plus magnetic force QE why are we doing that we're doing that because there are some devices that combine electric force with magnetic force okay so here you go Plus Q V cross B. Okay. I'm gonna copy that. Okay. So we have this this new equation now. It's uh, six forty right now. Okay, I want, I want to stop right now, and next time we are going to see what type of device we can build using the electric and magnetic field, okay? So here you go. Just remember, if I want to generate an, a uniform electric field, you, you can get two parallel plates uniformly charged to generate an electric field. If we combine the electric field with a magnetic field, we have a very important device here that we call the velocity selector, okay? I'm gonna just touch very quickly how, how does it work. This device here is called the velocity selector. Okay, so here you go. You put an electric charge in between this plate, okay? You, you are going to have an electric field applied to the charge. If the charge is not moving at all, there will be no magnetic field at this instant of time, right? But suppose that we have a velocity in this direction. If you have a velocity in this direction, all you gotta do is to do the V cross B operation to get a magnetic force that's gonna be that's gonna counter the electric force depending on the velocity of the charge this force here may end up being equal to this force here and the particle is gonna move 
in a straight line, okay? Only particles with these velocities, this specific velocity, is going to move in a straight line. Okay, and we can even do, uh, we can even determine what's the value of the electric field and the magnetic field, okay? So here you go. In order, before we go 642, we still can do a little bit here. Okay. Uh, let, let us subject, subject an electric charge to a uniform electric, to uniform electric and magnetic fields. Okay. Also, assume that the velocity vector of the particle is perpendicular, is perpendicular, is simultaneously perpendicular, is simultaneously perpendicular to both fields, to both fields, okay? What uh, the subject of uniform electric and magnetic fields E and B? What must what must be V if the net force were to be equal to zero? So going back right in here in this drawing, right? F E the net, you know, the this net force must be equal to zero. This net force must be equal to zero. And what does it mean? Under this condition, it doesn't matter what is the charge of the particle because you have this common term, the common parameter for both terms of the equation, right? All you have to do is to, hold, to have uh, this relation here. This relation here must hold. Okay, we go. We go. If V is perpendicular to B, okay, we're gonna have, uh, we're just gonna have a regular equation like that, VB, the scalar equation VB. You know, and uh, the velocity, you know, the, and don't forget, we we must have a negative sign here, right? Because that cross product must end up being negative for this thing to cancel out. And if we have a charged particle with a velocity given by E divided by V, B. then the particle will not be deflected along that path. Okay? So it's 646 now. And don't forget, that's the principle of, the, of a device that we call. This is the principle of the device we call the velocity selector. Okay, so we can stop now and I will meet you again next week. Thank you. Thank you for coming.